Okay, it is seven o'clock, so we are going to get started. Everyone, welcome. My name is Erin Mastine. I am the communications coordinator here at New Hampshire Lakes. If I could just get a yes or a nod, if everyone can hear me, that would be great. Wonderful. Okay, so tonight we are going to be um, having a presentation, Boating Safety 101. And this is part of our Explore Lakes with New Hampshire Lakes webinar series. We will be offering this series through the rest of the summer and into the fall, at least, probably more to come after that. Um, after this presentation this evening, we will be having a, an additional presentation on June 16th, lake level management, and then on July 7th, enjoying lakes um, while protecting wildlife. And you can register for all those upcoming sessions just the way you did for this, most likely. Go right onto our website at newhampshirelakes.org, explore lakes webinars. Um, as you've probably seen, you can use the chat box while we are enjoying the presentation. You can use that to ask questions and our lovely moderator, Michelle, will be answering questions throughout the presentation. And something has happened with our settings and we normally have participants normally um, muted automatically. So please do try to stay on mute throughout the presentation. Otherwise it can get quite noisy and distracting for everybody. Okay, so today we will be having Boating Safety 101, and that will be presented by Captain Tim Dunalevy um, from the New Hampshire Marine Patrol. Um, this meeting will be recorded, so just keep that in mind. If you do accidentally come off mute, that will be recorded for the presentation and will be up on our YouTube channel. Um, if you leave your camera on, remember that other people can see you. And to limit bandwidth, um, you may want to turn your camera off. And that just sort of helps, um, you know, as long as we have good Wi Fi, it shouldn't be a problem. But um, it is possible that it could slow things down. So, as you should know, um, like I've just mentioned, you can enter questions there into the chat box. Um, if you're unfamiliar with how to do that, if you bring your mouse down to the bottom of the screen, a black bar should come up. Um, and you can see that there's a chat option. It'll bring up this little box. You can chat it and everybody will see what your question is. And we will do our best to make sure that we um, either answer those questions as they come in, if we know the answers, but we will also be holding some for the end um, for Captain Dunleavy to be able to answer. And tomorrow you will receive an evaluation form um, from us. Please fill that out and give us your feedback so that we can um, you know, make these as best as possible and get ideas for future presentations. You'll also re receive an email with links to the webinar recordings and slides to watch again and share with others. And just a little bit about New Hampshire Lakes quickly, if you don't know who we are, um, we're the only publicly supported nonprofit organization working for all of New Hampshire's 1000 lakes. And we hope that you will become a supporter. You can do that right on our homepage at newhampshirelakes.org. And it's our mission to keep New Hampshire's lakes clean and healthy now and in the future. We work with partners, promote clean water policies and responsible use and inspire the public to care for our lakes. And we have three programs mainly that we focus on. One is our advocacy program working at the state capitol to um, you know, work with all different kinds of partners to um, shape laws that are going to help our lakes. We have our conservation program, which um, is both our lake host program, um, helping boaters learn how to clean drain and dry their boats, as well as our new Lake Smart program, which is actually an evaluation program where we can come to your home and let you know um, things you may be able to do to help lakes right from your own property. We also have our outreach programs, and that is where this lovely series of webinars comes from. And we want to take a moment to just thank our, our sponsors, Graponi Automotive Group. They've been a longtime supporter of New Hampshire Lakes, and uh, we're very thankful for the support that they've given us. And I personally 
have shopped at Grapponi. My last two vehicles have come from Grapponi. They're an excellent uh, business to work with. Um, they have great customer service. And if anyone is in the market for a new vehicle, we hope that you will support them. And we are your hosts this evening. I'm Erin, I mentioned myself before, and Michelle Davis, she's our Policy and Advocacy Program Manager. She's gonna be helping me with the chat box as we move through the evening. And your expert presenter this evening is Captain Timothy Dunleavy. He's from Marine Patrol. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to him so he can get started. And I will stop sharing my screen so that he can start sharing his screen. How's that look to you, Aaron? Looks great. Very good. Aaron, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, folks, and thank you for joining us here this evening. Uh, I would like to first start off by thanking Aaron and, and Michelle and, and those folks at New Hampshire Lakes. Uh, Marine Patrol certainly considers New Hampshire Lakes one of our, our partners uh, as we look to uh, protect and provide our public waters for the enjoyment of, of all folks to enjoy. Um, on behalf of Commissioner Robert Quinn, uh, Colonel Nathan Noyes uh, of the State Police, I would like to uh, welcome you to our presentation. At any time you have any questions, certainly uh, the great folks at New Hampshire Lakes will be able to uh, foster that information getting to me and I'll be happy to answer those questions as we go through this with a Q&A uh, period at the end. That said, uh, PowerPoint can be a wonderful thing, but at the same time, uh, so, so many of us are, are used to PowerPoint presentations. I will try not to bore you with the presentation, but only use it as a background uh, and, and remind folks that this will be made available to you should you wanna go back and, and look at specific details uh, on the New Hampshire Lakes website. And I will do my best to um, make it as entertaining as possible considering the forum. And, and this is a great opportunity for us to help spread the word of safety, uh, particularly as it relates to our recreational boating uh, in New Hampshire. With that, uh, we'll get started. Uh, we are uh, a unit within the New Hampshire State Police, uh, part of the Department of Safety. And we are the primary agency in New Hampshire for uh, in the enforcement of New Hampshire's boating laws and rules. We are composed primarily of part-time officers, uh, approximately 42 this year uh, going into the season, uh, complemented by seven full-time officers that work year-round. Of those seven, three of those are assigned to our seacoast for a year-round patrol that includes recreational enforcement in the summer. And certainly a significant component of that patrol in the wintertime is related to homeland security. We're responsible uh, for generally three primary uh, functions, and that those functions are, are charged to us through the legislature and through statute. And our first and, and primary focus is the enforcement of voting laws and rules, as I mentioned. We are also responsible for, uh, within that, uh, any criminal laws that, that are violated on our waters, investigation of accidents and drownings, and, and one of the uh, themes that we have within our, our agency is that our mission is to enforce our laws through education and not intimidation. And, and while that, that might mean that our, our method of education might be a warning, it might be uh, just a, a, a teaching moment that one of our officers may have when they, when they find something uh, unsafe on the water, it might even mean being arrested. Perhaps if you're impaired and operating your boat, uh, that type of education might include a method that includes a custodial arrest. The statute also requires us to make sure that we mark the hazards on our inland waters. We maintain approximately 5,000 aids to navigation across the state in the form of uh, red and black top spar buoys, uh, 
we have regulatory signage as well as speed limit signs, no wake signs. And we maintain about 300 flashing navigation lights across the state. We inspect uh, commercial vessels that might include a fishing charter or an excursion boat like the Mount Washington or the Mount Sunapee uh, or any camp boat, that, uh, a ski boat or, or a, a transport boat that might be associated with a kid's camp. And then, as I mentioned before, we provide security on our sea coast. We regularly patrol about 300 bodies of water across the state of approximately 975 uh, public bodies of water. That includes any body of water that is 10 acres or more in size. Last year, that included about 101, a little, little over that, thousand uh, boats that were registered in New Hampshire. That does not include uh, tourists that come from another state when their boat is, is registered in that home state, nor does it uh, include any paddle craft to include stand up paddle boards, canoes, and kayaks. As I mentioned, we have authority on all bodies of water having 10 or more acres in size, and that includes uh, lakes, ponds, rivers, and obviously the Atlantic Ocean. Our main headquarters for the state is in Guilford, New Hampshire, on the shores of Lake Winnipesaukee uh, in Glendale Bay. As I mentioned, we have a homeland security mission uh, where our primary role there is to uh, provide waterfront security for our strategic facilities uh, along the seacoast to include Seabrook, Rye, and Portsmouth Harbors. We operate 365 days a year uh, with our primary inland patrols running from ice out, depending upon where you are in the state, uh, through the end of October and then on a, an on-call basis until ice in. We operate in all weather conditions. This happens to be a photo from Lake Winnipesaukee on a, on a blustery day. Uh, particularly those bodies of water where we have summer residents on islands where they depend upon marine patrol and local fireboats to respond to all their emergency needs. Uh, just like what happens in town, uh, 24 hours a day, there's a potential for some uh, residential need for either law enforcement or, or fire services, EMT services. And, and being an agency that is quick to respond with, with folks on call, if not already on patrol, all Marine Patrol officers are certified in first aid, CPR, and often carry an AED. Not all boats do, but, but those lakes that have islands where we do have uh, seasonal residents, oftentimes our boats are equipped with AEDs. So we are administering first aid oftentimes before our fire uh, partners can be there. Our officers, depending upon their assignment, may be assigned to a fixed location like on Lake Winnipesaukee, Winnesquam, Squam, Newfound, Sunapee, Ossipee, uh, where, we, where the state actually will lease or have a boat at a dock ready to go at all times. Other parts of the state, if you get into the, into the counties away from our largest lakes, our officers are towing a state patrol boat uh, and may visit four, five, six bodies of water or more a day, depending upon their patrol assignments. Uh, we'll respond to emergencies, uh, routine calls for service, uh, re calls for, for repairs to our, our aids to navigation, uh, or any other type of on-water issue that, that falls under our jurisdiction. We are required by statute to investigate all boating accidents and all drownings, whether they be those drownings be related to a boat accident, uh, or a swimming event. Uh, as long as that drowning uh, takes place on a public body of water, Marine Patrol is the agency responsible for investigating uh, that tragedy. Uh, Again, as I mentioned, we conduct all the inspections of commercial vessels in, in the state. And if you are operating one of those commercial vessels, you're required to be at least 18 years of age and you are required to carry a New Hampshire commercial boat operator's license and we are responsible for testing those operators as well. 
Certainly, if any of you have ever been stopped by a Marine Patrol officer, the first thing that we do is we make sure that you are carrying the proper safety equipment on board uh, for you and your passengers, and that your boat is seaworthy uh, and, and not going to be a hazard to either your par party or uh, other vessels in the area. And certainly the primary piece of safety equipment that we are looking for, because it applies to all boats on New Hampshire waters, is life jackets. Again, this PowerPoint will be available to you on the New Hampshire Lakes website when we're done tonight. So I won't be reading these to you, but I will just say, the, point out the, the, the umbrella uh, requirements for life jackets. And I'll say that by saying this, there is no vessel on New Hampshire waters that doesn't require a wearable life jacket for each person on board, with two exceptions, because there's always an exception to every rule. Wind, uh, wind surfers uh, are exempt from life jacket requirement, a windsurfer, and competition rowing skulls and racing kayaks. Uh, those vessels need to be involved in, in rowing activity uh, or paddling activity uh, for that uh, exception to be in place. So if those types of vessels, rowing skulls, kayaks are in competition, or you are a windsurfer, you are exempt from the life jacket requirement. Everything else requires that person to have either that life jacket on board for them or to be wearing it. In the case of uh, personal watercraft, uh, in the case of children 12 years of age and under, uh, and this includes folks, stand up paddle boards. SUPS as they're known are deemed a vessel under Coast Guard regulation and therefore your stand up paddle boards do require a person to have that life jacket on board the board with them. And if they're 12 years of age or under, they must be wearing it. Uh, there are five different types of life jackets. Uh, types one, two, three, and five uh, are the wearable type that we accept and look for. The type four is a throwable. And for those persons who have boats that are greater than 16 feet in length, in addition to the wearable, you must have one throwable type device. Uh, when you think of throwables, you're, you're talking about the square seat cushions with the straps on them. If you look at the tag, you will see the Coast Guard approval on that. Probably the most famous, if you're my age, the most famous life ring that we're all familiar with is uh, if we were fans of Gilligan's Island, uh, the life ring on board uh, was, had the, the name of the vessel, the SS Minnow on it in the opening credits to the show. Uh, so life rings and throw cushions. Again, type twos, type threes. Type three is probably the most popular type for water sports. Type two is probably the least expensive and the one we find on our inspections to be the most common uh, for those passengers on the boats themselves. And they all have various characteristics uh, that are, are um, specific to perhaps your, the activity you're involved with, whether it be water skiing, uh, you may have a, a barefoot suit that has flotation, you may have uh, an inflatable type device. If you're a fisher person, you may have uh, the fanny pack belt type life jacket inflatable. If you're one who likes to uh, have uh, free, free movement of your shoulders and arms, if you're rowers or, or perhaps uh, a user of a stand-up paddleboard. Again, if you are um, 12 years of age or younger, you must wear that life jacket whenever the boat is underway. If the boat is at anchor, uh, that is a different story. But when you are being transported, uh, the boat is underway, that, that child needs to be wearing the jacket. The only exception to that law would be uh, an excursion boat that has a railing of at least three feet high. Uh, but there's only a few boats in New Hampshire that have that type of a, a craft. Um, as we mentioned, personal watercraft, in the case of personal watercraft, New Hampshire has a unique definition um, as, uh, for ski craft. Uh, ski craft is a two-person machine, the capacity of two people, and the occupants must wear a life jacket on ski craft. Um, if you are being towed behind any kind of a vessel, uh, you must uh, have uh, jackets uh, on, that being a water skier, or perhaps a, a wakeboarder or a tuber. And as I mentioned, stand up paddle boards. 
our next conversation is going to um, address lighting on New Hampshire boats. And, and certainly the um, opportunities for you to get more information on lighting for your craft are, are available anywhere, including Marine Patrol headquarters. Our boater's guide, which, which we put out about 120,000 of those uh, handouts every year and are available in, in marinas and rest areas. And certainly we do even drop one into the mail to you if you would like. They're also available online through our website in an electronic version. That boater's guide is a digest of New Hampshire laws and, and information on lighting is, is included in that document. Just know this, uh, again, is a quick, quick summary. If you are out at night on any vessel on New Hampshire waters, you are required to display some kind of lighting. That includes you folks who go out in a canoe or a kayak or on a stand-up paddleboard. Even though you're close to shore, you are still required to display some sort of light. And in the case of a manually propelled boat, that's a white light visible for 360 degrees on the horizon for a distance of two miles. When you get into sailboats and power boats, uh, power boats, regardless of size, will need that 360 white light as well in combination with your colored lights, red and green uh, on the bow, typically on the bow. And a sailboat, unless that white light is at the top of a mast, will not show a 360 degree white light. And that's so that another boater can tell if they're only seeing one color at a time, they know that they're looking at a sailboat and therefore the sailboat is the, uh, the vessel with right of way. Uh, when you see a white light with, with a combination of a color, then that, those colors are telling you who has right of way, red for stop, green for go, uh, and, and know that you have uh, another powerboat that you're encountering on the water. So these lights mean more to being able to be seen on the water. They also play a role in, in what boats have right of way over another. And remember, that when you are operating uh, on the lakes at night and you are approaching another boat, if you are not sure which boat has the right of way, it's one thing to insist that you had right of way and it's another to be dead right. Do not insist on that right of way if it appears as though a collision is imminent. It is everyone's responsibility to avoid collision regardless of those who might have the right of way. The lights, they need to be on uh, between sunset and sunrise, and also during periods of restricted visibility to include fog, snow, um, or any other thick weather condition. If you own a power boat, you're also required to have a sound producing device to alert others uh, that may be on the water to a hazard, or perhaps you're broken down and need to uh, get someone's attention. Again, you can go back and look at the requirement for your type of boat, but essentially you need to have a hand, mouth, or power operated horn, whistle, uh, aerosol uh, horn, power horn that can be heard uh, at least in New Hampshire for at least a half mile. And for the majority of you, um, that half mile is, is what you will need. If you're in a boat 26 feet and over, you need to be heard at least a mile away. I, I always chuckle and when I, when I teach our boating education courses, uh, we can put a man on the moon, we can, send, um, we can send craft to Mars, but we can never seem to keep a boat's power horn operating for more than two years. Uh, so always check those in the spring, make sure your fuses are good and those horns are working. Again, for power boats, Fire extinguishers are a requirement. Uh, you want to have a, an, an, at least a type B, you know, oftentimes the fire extinguishers that we can buy at our uh, department stores are ABC type. For boating, you just need a, a minimum of a B type fire extinguisher. Uh, and it needs to be a size one or higher. So a type B size one is the requirement on the majority of our boats in New Hampshire. Uh, again, for all power boats, uh, the only exception to that is a power boat that is propelled by an electric motor. Uh, anybody who has solely an electric motor on board are exempt from the fire extinguisher requirement. 
Those extinguishers are required to be Coast Guard approved. They need to be within arm's reach of what the occupants on board. And contrary to some uh, belief, although we encourage it, they are not required to be mounted. Uh, certainly when, when you are in your greatest time of need, knowing a location, having your fire extinguisher mounted is the best practice, the safest practice, because you then won't have to scurry about the boat trying to remember where it was left or, or where maybe some other person may have moved it to when you weren't on board. So we do encourage you to mount them, but not a requirement. Here's a quick little chart that shows you what you need for portable fire extinguishers on, your, on board your boat. And it mentions a fixed system uh, or uh, without a fixed system. If your boat is equipped with an automatic fire extinguisher system in the engine compartment, then you do not need a hand portable if your boat is less than 26 feet. Again, we talked about requirements versus best practice. And certainly if you have a fire extinguishing system in your engine compartment, uh, but your fire is up underneath the dash because it's an electrical fire, or uh, you have some other fixture away from the engine compartment that is causing a spark, you're still gonna wanna have a, a portable in addition to that fixed system to be able to address any other location that a fire may break out. And the other side of that coin is, uh, the fire may not be yours. You may come across a person whose boat is on fire and in, in trouble. And for those of you who ever discharged a fire extinguisher, uh, you always seem to wish you had a larger one when trying to put out that fire. So being a passerby with a, with a fire extinguisher that you can lend or, or assist uh, another boater fighting a fire, uh, those portables are a good thing to have on board, whether you need them or not. The one other thing that I will remind you uh, with a fixed fire extinguishing system, the way those systems work is that when they sense heat of a certain temperature within your engine compartment, they discharge the uh, extinguishing agent within the bottle. Uh, oftentimes they are designed to react with oxygen in that compartment uh, by uh, having a chemical reaction which eliminates the oxygen from, from the fire triangle. And without oxygen, we will not have a fire. Oftentimes people will sense that that automatic system has discharged. And the first thing they do is they go back to their engine compartment and pull it back to see what the source of the, the problem is, reintroducing oxygen into that environment, which oftentimes can cause a significant flare up right in the face of the person uh, pulling that engine compartment back. So if you have an automatic system that's gone off, uh, get to shore, the last thing you should do is to uh, explore why it has discharged, at least while you're on the water. This might be a good time to, to pause for a moment and see if there are any questions for, uh, from you folks as it relates to safety equipment required on boats. Uh, Captain Dunleavy, the only question that I have in the chat right now um, is maybe something that you're about to address, but it has to do with spar buoys. Um, and we're wondering if spar buoys have a record of their GPS location. There are There's at least one buoy on Lake Massasecum that has moved um, over the winter slash springtime. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and I thank you for that question. Uh, we do maintain for our own use uh, GPS coordinates for the majority of the nav aids on our inland waters. As we all know, GPS equipment over the years uh, has varying accuracies. And certainly for us, um, when we are marking our hazards, we have to allow for lake level fluctuation. And we've experienced some, some significant fluctuations the last year, depending upon the season. With that, we need to be able to ensure that these markers are close to the hazard uh, that they are intended to warn folks of. And so therefore we have to provide a little bit of scope in the anchoring tackle that we use to keep these on station. Uh, so with that, we are always going to have some varying distances from the actual hazard uh, between, between the hazard and the spar buoy itself. So we always warn folks to be very careful when approaching these, these markers. That being said, in the case of Massasecum, 
If you've observed a, a market that is out of place, I'd ask you to give Marine Patrol headquarters a call. I've got some phone numbers at the end of this presentation where we will, uh, the dispatcher will take a call for service uh, from you, uh, perhaps ask you for your, your name and phone number in the event the officer needs to speak to you about uh, a marker. And uh, otherwise we'll go out and, and, and put that back on station. We try to, uh, particularly as the peak of the boating season comes around here in the next couple of weeks, we try to do our, our aid to navigation maintenance uh, in the middle of the week, uh, first thing in the morning. Visibility is, is oftentimes the best when in the early morning when we can see the hazards, uh, there's less chop on the water. And, and frankly, uh, our officers can go out and perform their maintenance responsibilities and not be um, interrupted by uh, some sort of a boating emergency call that, that we often get uh, as activity increases on the weekends. Thank you for the question. Um, um, I just have one more question um, and it has to do with the requirements around wearing an engine shutoff cord on New Hampshire waters. Um, and that's in relation to new federal regulations um, that have come into effect this last year. Very good, thank you, Michelle. Engine cutoff switches. Um, uh, it is at the federal level uh, now a requirement if your boat is equipped with a, an engine cutoff switch, uh, anybody on a boat less than 26 feet or 26 feet and under uh, are required to wear it when the boat is uh, operating above headway or no wake speed. That is a federal requirement uh, and not, I repeat, not a state requirement. The New Hampshire legislature has not even entertained uh, uh, such a statute. And uh, while it may come down the road now that the feds have, have, have come out with it, New Hampshire does not require wearing the engine cutoff switch lanyard, or if you're equipped with an electronic device. However, if you are on federal waters or waters with federal jurisdiction, which in New Hampshire is primarily our coastal waters, the Connecticut River and the Merrimack River, those, those are federal waters. Um, although you're not going to see a Coast Guard or federal presence on those rivers after the first, north of the first dams, you will experience Coast Guard uh, on, our, on our coastal waters. Those federal agencies can and will enforce that lanyard requirement uh, on the coast, uh, but New Hampshire Marine Patrol officers will not. That being said, I can tell you that Marine Patrol on an annual basis will investigate and respond to probably at least a half dozen calls a year where someone in a small outboard aluminum rowboat type, Boston Whaler type boat um, doing what in our line of business is called the circle of death. That's when a boat like that, when, when someone accidentally lets go of the tiller handle or perhaps the steering wheel, outboard engines because of their torque if, 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 not, uh, if, if, if not had their hands on it at speed, will quickly turn to one side. And if you've ever seen a, a rowboat with the outboard motor turned all the way to one side at speed, it goes up on its side and banks into a tight circle. If an operator that slips out of their hand and that boat quickly goes into that bank and that turn, it is not uncommon for the operators to be ejected from that boat and they are in, ejected to the inside of that circle of death. And so I would, again, take advantage of a teaching moment, especially for you parents out there who, who are breaking in your children on small outboards to make sure that they are attaching that lanyard to them when they're underway. Oftentimes that circle of death is around a young child rather than an adult. And um, it, it, is, it is a scary, scary moment. Uh, I will remind folks that yes, we know the lanyard sometimes can be very cumbersome, but technology is out there now readily available uh, for a wireless lanyard. It's an electronic lanyard that allows not only the operator, but it can be for your dog, it can be for another passenger to wear a small device that looks like 
a little, the old pagers that we used to see people carrying, smaller than a cell phone, that has a sensor. Uh, and if that pager or that, that uh, wireless device, uh, for whatever reason, exceeds a predetermined distance from that sensor, the motor will shut off. Uh, and, and for those of you who have pets, uh, Marine Patrol is regularly on the busy weekends on our lakes, finding pets swimming in the middle of the lake because they've jumped off the boat, fallen off the boat, and the owners don't even know it. Uh, you can attach one of these to a pet's collar. You can attach it to anybody on board the boat. And if the operator doesn't realize someone has, has left the craft, suddenly the engine will stop. Great technology, relatively um, uh, inexpensive considering the insurance that it offers. So, uh, but again, not required by state law. That was a long-winded explanation for something that wasn't part of the presentation. <laughs> Thank you, folks. White top and black top buoys. These are the most common buoys on our waters. Um, and essentially, if you do not have a compass on board your boat, they probably will not be useful to you. So go out and buy yourself a, a little compass uh, or a big compass, whatever you prefer. Uh, but you will need a compass to use these if you are not familiar with the body of water you are navigating. A black top buoy essentially is telling you that the, um, the safe side of the hazard that you want to navigate on is either the north or the east. And the red top buoy is south or west. So if I encounter a black top buoy and I look at my compass and I am traveling in a north northerly direction or a southerly direction, I want to pass to the east of that black top buoy. If I am traveling from east to west or west to east and I encounter the black top, I want to stay to the north of it. Now on the water, how do you remember that? Here's my little trick. Um, in, in New Hampshire, when we have a nor'easter, when we have a nor'east storm, the skies turn black. That just happens to be the way I remember it. If I'm traveling on the water and I encounter a red top buoy, and, and while my, my picture here uh, is, is simply an illustration, the red top buoys will have a little, a secondary red stripe. There'll be a three inch gap uh, from the wide stripe at the top of the marker. There'll be a three inch white and then another red stripe. That is so that you can, if you're colorblind or from a distance, you're not sure because of the sun, what color buoy you're dealing with, if you see a second stripe uh, underneath the, the, the wide stripe, you're looking at a red top. And it's just the opposite. If I'm traveling south to north or north to south, I'm gonna to stay to the west and vice versa. If I'm gonna be operating east to west or west to east, I'm gonna to stay to the south of that marker. How do I remember that? Well, the United States Southwest tends to be hot and red is certainly a color that we associate with hot. If we encounter an all black and an all red marker, these will always be in pairs and they are channel markers. Uh, it doesn't matter what color you have on your left or on your right, on inland waters, if you encounter an all black and an all red, you simply stay between them and that'll keep you in the uh, safe portion of the channel. Um, headway speed. Uh, we had a recent change legislatively in the definition of headway speed. It used to reference six miles per hour. It no longer does. And so headway speed or no wake speed in New Hampshire is known as the slowest speed that a boat can travel and still maintain steerage, safe steerage. Uh, so with those of you who have a straight inboard ski boat, a uh, surfing boat, uh, that type of a craft. Oftentimes, remember, steerage comes from water flow past the rudder. And, and because of the displacement, because of the, the size of the engine and the way the prop is connected to the engine, even though you're in neutral, you may, may still experience a spinning of the prop. Oftentimes, to maintain safe steerage and to maintain headway speed, you need to be in and out of neutral in a straight inboard. Uh, to maintain that slowest speed. Uh, in the case of a jet propelled boat, 
you have zero steerage if there isn't flow or throttle being applied to that jet pump. So um, certainly headway speed in a no wake zone does not mean you do not apply throttle in the case of a jet propelled boat. Uh, water skiing, uh, we know quickly that anything you are being towed upon uh, in uh, behind a boat attached to a ski line is considered a water skier. That means uh, uh, your, your wake borders, it means uh, uh, a chair on a wooden disc. We've seen it all. Um, that is defined as water skiing. Uh, you need to have no more than two people can be towed at the same time on all devices except for tubes, which I'll talk about that in a moment. You must have an observer at least 13 years of age on board in addition to the operator. And it is a violation to ski between sunset and sunrise. So if you feel it's dark enough to have your lights on, then you shouldn't be skiing. Pull those skiers in. Uh, if you have any questions, the back of that document I mentioned earlier, our Boaters Digest does have a sunset sunrise chart by date so that you know whether or not you should be skiing. And then anybody on skis being towed behind the boat must be wearing a life jacket. The only exception is if you're towing a boat that obviously has broken down there in another boat. These laws do not apply to people in other boats being towed. That observer who's at least 13 years to be at least physically able to assist someone who's down in the water, perhaps injured. And when it comes to tubes, um, if you are towing, you have a maximum of six people can be towed behind the boat if they are on an inflatable device. Um, if you have more than two people um, being towed, then you need to have two observers. Uh, if you have under three people on tubes, you can get away with one observer. Again, six is the maximum. And that can be on one device or it could be six devices. That's completely up to you. And Marine Patrol uh, last year started partnering with the uh, Water Sports Industry of America and then um, the New Hampshire Marine Trades Association in bringing attention to those who wake surf of the Wake Responsibly campaign uh, that is uh, being rolled out at the national level. Uh, because of the wakes that are generated by wake boats and wake surfing, operators are encouraged to make sure they're operating at least 200 feet away from shore and other craft reminded you to remind you to keep your music at reasonable levels and that water sound travels across the water and to choose your music and the lyrics of that music wisely when you are out in public and to uh, minimize your repetitive passes across or in front of the same length of shoreline as you engage in this activity. Uh, all common sense practical approaches to good wake surfing responsibly uh, responsible wake surfing practices. The most violated statute in New Hampshire is our safe passage law, which essentially says if you are 150 feet away, that's half a football field or two ski lines, two tow lines um, away from rafts float swimmers, swim areas and beaches, the shoreline, docks, moorings, or other boats, you are required to be at no wake speed. So picture your boat being in a bubble and that bubble moving along with you as you go, 150 feet in any direction. If any of the items on the list here in this slide uh, burst that bubble 150 feet away from you, you need to go to no wake speed, regardless of whether or not you're towing someone, by the way. Uh, boating education uh, is a requirement in New Hampshire for anyone operating a boat in excess of 25 horsepower, you are required to be to have and carry upon you uh, a proof of boating education certificate that is NASBLA approved, uh, whether it be a New Hampshire state certificate, a uh, United States certificate with that NASBLA endorsement, uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary, or United States Power Squadron uh, course completion is accepted. As I mentioned, the exceptions are Coast Guard Auxiliary, Power Squadron. Um, registrations, I'll touch quickly on this. All boats that are powered are required to be registered. Sailboats uh, less than 12 feet are exempt from that. 
rowboats, canoes, and kayaks that are manually propelled only. Once you put an electric motor or some sort of power on a paddlecraft, you are now a powerboat and you require registration. We do uh, recognize the registrations from other states for 30 consecutive days here in New Hampshire. And then other exemptions are, are uh, government vessels, um, but, but on inland waters, it's rare that we would see anything like that. Uh, just a couple of slides here. Some of the day, the day in the life of a Marine Patrol officer and some of the things that we might encounter. Uh, obviously, these are some accidents. Uh, we have some people in the water that were, were fishing uh, and, and fell overboard. We had an offshore powerboat actually roll over and that's, you see just the bow floating there. And then and we had a, a boat fire and overheat that turned into a, a fire. Um, plane crashes, uh, you see a, a, a boat down on the coast. That's a tanker that we are escorting or a cargo ship we're escorting as part of our Homeland Security mission on the coast. Uh, tube stock, which was an event up on the uh, Connecticut River in Hanover for a lot of years. Um, tube stock, uh, well, you can imagine what, where they got that name from. Uh, again, a couple of other photos of some accidents that we have. Um, the majority of the ones that we are showing here uh, were alcohol related. Uh, this is a, a, an accident, it took us a while to find. It was observed, an, a boat was observed crossing Weir's Bay by the Mount Washington, went behind Eagle Island and never came out the other side. We did a search of the island and, and couldn't see anything the next day we kept searching and uh, we suddenly started seeing a little evidence in the bushes of some issues and, and this boat was high and dry parked in the island through the blueberry bushes and, and explains why we couldn't see it that night. Uh, this gentleman uh, was found sleeping in the nearby gazebo after a, uh, a rough night at the bar. Uh, although he made every attempt to get his boat off the island uh, as we found the boat in full reverse when we arrived the next morning. Uh, I, guess I, don't, I guess I know now uh, why he couldn't back off the island. Uh, in a boat fire. Uh, collision with an island. You'll see the uh, bullseye effect here on this ledge uh, where you'll see where the boat struck, uh, struck that edge. Uh, that is fiberglass that is melted and impregnated into the, uh, the granite ledge. This is the cabin nearby. That's a fragment of the windshield. Uh, the force of that accident was so significant that the fragment of that windshield was actually embedded into the wood siding of the camp. And a quick plug for uh, our recruiting. Uh, Marine Patrol is always recruiting on an annual basis for uh, some seasonal officers uh, to patrol our waterways. You are uh, required to be a part-time certified police officer in New Hampshire as part of the position, which includes uh, being paid to attend the 200 hour part-time academy. Uh, you have a, another 100 hours of Marine class law training, another 40 to 100 hours of, of boat training, practical exam training uh, on the water. Uh, and then finally, I'll wrap up as we, as we approach the end of the presentation here, some interesting statistics uh, for the last uh, uh, several years here in New Hampshire, last four years. You'll see a significant climb in the uh, registrations uh, as we experience the boom of boating activity related to COVID, uh, largest jump in boat registrations that we've seen in a long time. Uh, and, and as would, we would come to expect, more boating activity, uh, the more accidents that we're gonna have, reportable accidents. Uh, I will mind, remind you that our, our accidents too, oftentimes are related to property damage. And with the low water that we have seen, uh, or we saw last year, uh, a lot of reportable accidents were people hitting uh, hazards that they, they weren't accustomed to hitting in the past. Um, I guess the, the most staggering statistic that I'll bring to your attention is down near the bottom. Where we, where we had to suspend our in-person classes for boating education. And the governor through an emergency order waived the proctored exam requirement for our online course. So if you were looking to get certified uh, and, and meet the boating education law, requirement law in New Hampshire, you could take the online course without the follow-up proctored exam. On average, our online students 
uh, range about 42 to 4,500 a year. Last year, we had over 30,000 new boaters take the New Hampshire Safe Boating Course. That is an accurate figure. 30,000 people uh, took the course. So about 25,000 more than we see on an average year. A staggering number. And then just some of the boats that you'll see um, uh, hours out on our waters. Uh, this one here is foliage season on the McGalloway River in the North Country. Beautiful, beautiful body of water. Uh, a tributary to, or actually it's an outlet uh, to Lake Umbagog. We do have personal watercraft that we will employ uh, for certain times of the year in certain bodies of water. Our coast patrol. And again, all times of year, uh, we assist with the, uh, the State Employees Association Santa Fun Drive in December. In our contact information and website, if you have a violation that you're observing or an emergency, it is absolutely an appropriate use of uh, 911, the number 911. You can call that. Uh, you will then be transferred to our dispatch. But 911 is a number that you can use to report a violation. Uh, perhaps it's a, a, an aid to navigation that's out of place or certainly any other type of emergency. And if it's a non-emergency related event, uh, you want to talk to us, give our dispatch call at 293-2037. Uh, there'll be a voice attendant, uh, which will give you some options to speak to boating education or the moorings department or, or any of the other services that we offer. And then we have two websites that are dedicated to our operation available to you as well. That's all I have um, for you folks for presentation purposes. Uh, I hope that wasn't too fast. Uh, it's a down and dirty boating 101, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions there or uh, chat with anybody that, that has a subject they'd like to bring up. We do have a few questions in the chat box. Um, someone is wondering if there's a process to request a slow or no wake buoy to be installed in a specific area on a New Hampshire lake. Sure. The first thing that we're going to look at is why does that no wake area need to exist? And if it is because of geography, in other words, two points of land come within 300 feet of itself, uh, which means a boat would have to be split down the middle to be able to be 150 feet away from both shorelines, then perhaps we will put in a no wake sign, uh, perhaps, for that area, uh, depending upon whether or not we've exhausted enforcement action first. If it is wider than 300 feet across and there are concerns, then any members of the public who own frontage on that body of water or live or reside in the town or towns which the body of water is found can sign a petition and with 25 signatures, the petition can request a specific restriction. That petition is then submitted to the Department of Safety Hearings Bureau where a public hearing will then be held in the town of the body of water. And uh, the, the legislature has authorized by statute the commissioner to rule on whether or not that no wake zone should be implemented, or perhaps it's a raft, a regulated rafting area or a speed limit. Uh, and their legislature said that there would be certain uh, things that would need to be examined as part of that decision. Impacts on environment, wildlife, uh, we would reach out to DES and fish and game, uh, and then obviously uh, boating traffic. So it's a petition process that is available to the public, 25 signatures or more, uh, submitted to the Department of Safety Hearings Bureau. Okay, what's next here? Um, is there a date when buoy lights are shut off for the season and then turned back on for the for the next on Lake Winnipesaukee? They've noticed that last October, the lights in the Weir's Channel were off at night. So our goal is to always have our nav lights flashing from uh, Memorial Day through Labor Day. And, and we prefer on our larger lakes through Columbus Day in October. Uh, with the, um, the, the channel markers and the flashing lights in the Weir's Channel, um, those are a little bit larger in size due to the volume of traffic that area experiences in the, in the, uh, in the summer months. And we contract a, a private vendor to handle those lights uh, because they're red and green, they flash in sync. And due to COVID, there was a 
product. Uh, they they are an Australian company. The product comes from Australia, and there was uh, difficulty getting product due to COVID last year. So we did get some calls that those lights were out a little earlier last year than we we normally would. But uh, you should see all our nav our nav aids. Uh, we 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 our goal is to have them all installed by Memorial Day. We like to keep them in at least until Columbus Day, um, knowing that while the boating seasons last longer and longer and longer as boating technology gets better, we still are fighting mother nature and we still have the same number of, of nav aids to remove, to beat mother nature. Uh, and, and while boaters can stay out longer, the weather doesn't necessarily last longer for us to have time to remove all of these items. So that's, that's, those are our timelines. Great. Um, this one is fitting that someone is wondering if you make multiple visits to different lakes in a day, how or when does the boat get cleaned? To date, our lake has no invasive plants and animals, but we know many lakes in the state that do. And what actions do you do, do you take to protect various bodies of water? Thank you for that question. That is a concern that is, is brought up often with us and our officers uh, on an annual basis are trained in the uh, removal and inspection of our boats and trailers for aquatic invasives. Uh, Amy Smagula from DES, who is the um, sort of the, the, the milfoil queen, I think as she self appoints herself, um, uh, speaks to our officers on our regular basis and all our new officers every year. Uh, we will rinse down uh, when we can. Um, we do inspections before we launch and after we retrieve our boats from every launch site. Um, we do not discharge bilge water uh, or, or anything like that in or around any body of water. And frankly, um, the majority of our patrol boats that are going from body of water to body of water uh, rarely take on water into the bilge anyway. Uh, that said, in an emergency situation, uh, well, what I was going to say is we participate in the lake host programs. Uh, we'll get in line, uh, just like every other boater, uh, unless it's an emergency situation where we'll cut the line where we can't take the time to, to allow the lake host to go through their inspections. But our officers are doing those inspections on their own. They are required to log those inspections uh, on their patrol logs that are submitted on a daily basis to headquarters, uh, noting those inspections uh, after each body of water. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, and you sort of touched on this earlier, but how do out-of-staters get a boating certificate? Uh, right now, there is not a state in the country that isn't offering the credentialed uh, course that we recognize through reciprocity with the NASBLA certification. Um, that state may not have the mandatory education requirement that New Hampshire has, uh, although you can count on one hand how many states don't have the requirement, those states are still offering the course to their residents. Uh, we routinely have people who are planning a vacation in New Hampshire who take New Hampshire's course online and the first day that they arrive in state for vacation show up for their proctored exam and, and, and leave that day with the full New Hampshire certification. In the case of renters, we have the 14-day agent program where marinas and, and other uh, businesses, enterprises, are registered and serve as an agent for Marine Patrol where a person, if they're renting a boat, can sit down, uh, study, study the New Hampshire Boaters Guide and, and New Hampshire laws, sit down and take a multiple choice exam on a computer. Uh, and if they pass that with a score of 80 or better, they are allowed to get a temporary certificate, which allows them to operate on, on our waters for only 14 days. If they're here longer, then they certainly, that gives them plenty of time to get the full-blown certification. Great. Um, okay, I think I know the answer to this one, but I'll let you answer it. Um, someone mentioned that they were studying the boat ed website for the exam, and it mentioned that you can have open bottles of alcohol in the boat, and they're assuming this is only for passengers, not for the driver of the boat. Is that correct? Uh, this is this is one of those questions we, we don't want to answer, but we will. <laughs> uh, New Hampshire does not have an open container law that applies to boating. So if you are 21 years of age on board a boat in New Hampshire 
it is legal for you to consume alcohol on the boat. That includes the operator. The operator of a boat can consume alcohol, can consume alcohol on board as long as they are not impaired to any degree. They cannot be impaired to any degree. Uh, once they are, then they are considered boating while intoxicated. And the penalties for boating while intoxicated are the same as the penalties for driving while intoxicated. In fact, if you lose your license for a conviction related to a, operating a boat, you are going to lose your driver's license on the road for the same time uh, with the same ramifications, insurance expenses, and all those other things that come along with it. That makes sense. Okay. Well, we are past our end time. Um, if you have questions that weren't answered, you can certainly email us at New Hampshire Lakes and we will do our best to get answers to you. I'm sure we can reach out to you, Captain Dunleavy, and um, you'll help us get those questions answered. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you so much for joining us this evening. This is a great time of year to remind everyone about the boating safety laws. Um, and if there's anything else that um, you wanted to add to the presentation, that would be great. I thank you all again for providing Marine Patrol with this opportunity. I, for those of you who have participated and joined us this evening, thank you for taking the initiative to perhaps uh, pick up on some more safety tips and, and help make New Hampshire waters uh, the safe boating waters that they are. Thank you folks very much. Yes, thank you all for joining us and everyone have a great evening. Thanks again, Aaron. I'm going to jump off now. I don't think anything else has come up. No, thank you. Have a good night. You too. Appreciate it.